is this really such a game changer that this petrodollar agreement has expired if the trend had already begun? Yeah, it is. It's just that it's accelerating. And again, this is what I mean, is that they do things methodically. It's one of these things that once you cross that line, the immediacy of, of the reaction would be profound. So I think it's more along the lines of doing things slowly and methodically and, and doing it the right way. It is a big deal. Did you know that Saudi Arabia ending the petrodollar deal could spell disaster for the US economy? According to Andy Schechtman, this move is accelerating a shift away from the US dollar's dominance. Imagine the implications, Saudi Arabia aligning with the BRICS, which control two of the four largest nuclear arsenals on the planet. This coalition is not only about military might, but also about controlling critical resources and strategic shipping lanes. China, for instance, dominates the mineral processing industry, handling 100% of the world's graphite, 90% of rare earth minerals, and 74% of cobalt. This methodical and strategic alignment could drastically reduce the significance of what the US has to offer, pushing the global economy into a new era. With the US already grappling with nearly $200 trillion in unfunded liabilities, the expiration of the petrodollar agreement threatens to accelerate the decline of the dollar and destabilize the economy. First of all, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is the largest regional military organization in the world. The BRICS control, what, two or three of the four largest nuclear arsenals on the planet? So when you talk about protection, yes, that is what the Saudi deal was originally about, was military protection. And, you know, it, it's one of these deals where I think that you, when you add the combined military might of the countries that they appear to be aligning with, um, it, it, it renders what the United States has to offer far less meaningful. Now, they have been talking about this other deal that they're working on, which it depends on a lot of things, what's going on between, you know, the relationship between Israel and, and Saudi Arabia and all of these other things that we can add into it, but which is kind of the reason I think they're straddling the line here. But what they are asking the United States for is very high tech weaponry, which they've never given the Saudi kingdom. They are kind of holding out for that. And, and who even knows if this other deal that they're talking about pans out. I would just simply say that they're aligning with a portion of the world that combined together has a far greater military capability than the West alone does. And that would be covered. But here again, the one thing I admire, Michelle, about the BRICS more than anything is how methodical they are. You know, when you look at Bitcoin and NVIDIA, to me, that's emblematic of the way the people in the United States expect everything to work just like that right now. You know, instant gratification is not quick enough. And, you know, I look back on 34 years of, of working in this industry to get to where I am now. Nothing comes quick. My um, mentor used to say, if you're in 7% per year, you're a rock star. And that takes time and compounding of time and of interest, but time. What the BRICS have been doing for the last 18 years, this is not something that just came out of the ether. It's been 18 years, but now the acceleration is happening. But they do things in a very methodical fashion and they're not doing it shotgun. They are not trying to be instantly gratified. They are doing it where they, they get one chance at this. The West has ruled the roost for what, 500 years um, collectively? And, and they, I think they realize that if they're going to do this, they need to be methodical about it and have all their ducks in a row. So this is something that I think is, is I admire how, how they're doing it and building all of the backfilling and building the alliances and doing it with shipping lanes, with commodities, with military, with GDP, with human population. And the connection, when you add the Belt Road into it, um, you're talking 90% of human population at some point when you put all of these groups together. One of the things I mentioned with you way back when was the Eurasian Economic Union and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I said they would join the BRICS and it's they're the same countries. Uh, Rickard said it last year and now the president of Belarus is calling for a summit to join these groups together into the BRICS. What you are seeing is a coalition of countries around the world that are uniting under, you know, whatever it be, pushing back against the hegemony finding safety in numbers or looking at this as their chance to become industrialized into a new system that they prefer one that seems to be more cooperative rather than coercive and when they say it's time and they flip the switch 
I think the West will have a hard time to push back against it because you will be talking the majority of human population, a larger military might, a larger portion of GDP, and the majority of the world's commodities. Um, and that's an important thing, you know, especially for a country that supports supposedly going green because there was just a report that came out of uh, JP Morgan that, that said um, China's dominance, real dominance lies in the mineral processing capabilities where they've processed 100% of the world's graphite supply in 2022, 90% of the rare earths and 74% of the cobalt. And the majority comes from the Eurasian continent anyway. But see, these are the kinds of things that they are all gathering and the countries in which they align with. And if you look at the comments that came out of that meeting uh, in Novograd, the countries that they want are all going to be related to strategic shipping lanes and, and natural resources. They're putting it together and doing it the right way, methodically regimented. And when they say now, uh, it'll be a religious experience because that's when everyone, that's when you would see the dumping, a massive dumping where the dollar bulls who have been right, um, albeit to a lesser and lesser and lesser degree, all of a sudden will realize that it's over. And I hope, I hope that doesn't happen, but it appears as though that's exactly what they're doing and doing it the right way rather than shotgunning it. Is this really such a game changer that this petrodollar agreement has expired if the trend had already begun? Yeah, it is. It's just that it's accelerating. And again, this is what I mean, is that they do things methodically. It's one of these things that once you cross that line, the immediacy of, of the reaction would be profound. So I think it's more along the lines of doing things slowly and methodically and, and doing it the right way. It is a big deal. You know, it used to be 100%. Okay, now it's 80%. And even a bigger deal to me is the lack of, of, of using the treasury market. The, the realization that holding treasuries is not only risky in a government that, you know, ultimately has chosen inflation over austerity, where rates ultimately have to rise. Even if the budget was uh, the, the, the budget was balanced, you mentioned a 34, almost $35 trillion debt. And remember, a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. We will inflate and rates will go higher because how the hell do you pay, um, uh, I don't know, uh, $99 trillion shortfall in Medicare Part B, $22 trillion shortfall in Medi Medicare Part D, the prescriptions, $77 trillion shortfall in Social Security, government and military pensions, the expansion of all of the welfare state. You know, people should check out the Cloward Piven theory. Blow your damn mind. Cloward Piven theory. I don't know if you've talked about it, but this is a, a very, very, very scary um, similarity, let's just simply say, and if we have time to talk about it, we can. But all of these unfunded liabilities that amount to nearly 200 trillion, who's going to pay for those? Who? And who in their right mind is going to buy a, tr a long term, a long dated duration treasury in a country that is in essence broke, who has chosen inflation over austerity, and the rest of the world is selling treasuries in order to buy commodities. So when you talk about you know, this being, you know, is this, could this be a, a, not a big deal? Yeah, it's all part of the same thing. And I think really what we are seeing is that more along the lines of, you know, how do we continue to, look, the Congressional Budget Office, Michelle, which is the last nonpartisan group in, in, in Washington, said by 2031, 100% of, of, uh, of tax revenue goes to pay just the interest on this debt. We're accumulating a trillion dollars of debt every 100 days just to pay the interest and mandatory entitlement like social security. But ask yourself this, how does the West maintain its supremacy, even militarily, when military spending is discretional? So we have to borrow money to fund a military to go around the world coercing people, ain't gonna happen. And, and that doesn't take into account the 17 million people who have entered this country illegally. Who's gonna pay for their, their food, their housing, their clothing, their, their medical, and you know, um, God forbid that one or two percent of them have bad intentions to this country. Every one percent is 170,000 people. Five percent is way bigger than any standing military. You could argue everything is different now in this country. And it starts with what amounts to, even if the majority of these people are seeking a better life at five percent, aren't? You're talking almost a million people that want to disrupt this country. So when you talk about buying gold and silver, or looking at the reasons to do these things, it's not to become wealthy, it's because it is wealth. 
gold and silver are wealth and the biggest money in the world is proving that by their acquisition and their repatriation. The lack of trust is profound. And the bigger question is how do we ever get that trust back? And hopefully the new administration, if there is God willing a new administration without being political, can, can pull us out of this nosedive. But short of that, I think we're in big trouble. And that's why I tell people to own gold. It's not to get rich. It's because it's, it's something that's outlived everything the world's ever thrown at it. And the big money around the world seems to echo that with their acquisition and repatriation.